haven't made a sewing video in an awfully long time so hello and welcome back and you can probably hear my neighbor using a chainsaw in the background so I apologize for that almost 30 years ago my husband and I were traveling through Utah and we came across this little quilt shop in a very small town and we bought these pot holders so you can see that they've been very well used so from looking at those I was able to make the aqua and blue ones which were one of the first ones that I started making and I just love that color combination I like to use these as coasters in my family room as well as pot holders I like to give these along with wedding gifts and gray is definitely the favorite color that's why I don't have as many gray to show you because I've given most of them away this set here is one of my favorite color combinations And I'm also a sucker for anything purple. The next gray one, I made a mistake. So I'll let you see if you can figure out what I did wrong. Once I cut the pieces out, I like to store them in little sandwich bags so that they're ready to go when I have time to sew. You'll need a piece of batting uh, 8 inches by 8 inches. I also use a product called Insulbrite and you can see it's got like a metallic piece in between the batting there and I use an 8 by 8 inch piece on top of my batting. I cut an 8 by 8 inch piece of fabric that I'm going to use for the back. And here are the strips that I have already cut out for my log cabin pot holder. And when I cut them out I stack them and I just put them in a sandwich bag to keep them to keep all of the pieces together. I usually have two different shades of fabric when I'm doing this, a light and a dark. I'm starting with the dark, darker red and that's a one and a half inch by one and a half inch square. Next I put the lighter fabric on top of that and that was also a one and a half inch by one and a half inch square. I also cut out a one and a half inch by two and a half inch piece of fabric in the same fabric as the lighter square. Next. I have a piece on the dark fabric, well two pieces actually. The first one is one and a half inch by two and a half inches and then the next one is one and a half, one and a half inches by three and a half inches. The next length in the lighter fabric is one and a half inches by three and a half inches and one and a half inches by four and a half inches. Which brings us back to the darker fabric, the red fabric, and I have a four and a half inch length and then a five and a half inch length.
On the light tan fabric, I have a five and a half inch length and then a six and a half inch length. And then for the last strips in the red fabric, I have a six and a half inch length and a seven and a half inch length. I made a three inch wide binding which I folded and ironed in half. It's the same method that I would do if I were making a quilt, finishing a quilt off. And I wasn't sure that I had enough so I am just going on all sides of the batting just to make sure that I have enough binding before I start. And I do. So you lay down the square backing with the wrong side up and put a piece of batting on top of it and then the insulbrite on top of that. And then I like to pin it on all four sides just so it won't shift around. The batting I'm using is a little thicker than I would normally use for a quilt. Then you'll take both one and a half inch by one and a half inch squares. In this case, the darker fabric will go on the bottom and then I have my little measuring thing here, but I, me I measure three and a half inches all the way around it to center it. And just get it as close as you can. And then I put, in this case, the lighter fabric face down on the darker fabric. And I'm just gonna secure it with a pin until I get it to the sewing machine. And I have my walking foot I have red thread on the top and the bobbin. You're going to need to have a quarter inch seam. And since all presser foots are different size, especially with walking foots, I will measure before I start to make sure that I have a quarter inch seam. So then you just open it up and it might take a few tries to figure out where you need to be sewing on your presser foot. You can see on here that it's about the same length as the next piece that goes on. So I think I've got it about right. I know it's silly and I've done a dozen of these, but I still get mixed up. In fact, I turned this around. I should have put this over here. Oh 
Lucy. Quiet. Okay, so I want the light piece to be on the top for me. And then I'm going to put the other light piece vertically and then sew that on. is going to be go down at the bottom and it's the the dark <laughs> sorry this is the time of night that the bunnies are out back so the red piece the dark goes down the bottom. I'll stitch that on. So I usually try to follow the stitching marks and we'll, um, we'll make it all even after we're done sewing. So this is the six and a half inch strip. And then I just like to go ahead and pin it open. And the last one left is the seven and a half inch strip. So the quilting part of it is done. I'm gonna go ahead and do the other one now. You can see 
that I cut these squares out bigger knowing that there would be waste but so I could trim them off and have them be even. Here I'm just showing you that if you wanted to make a quilt using this method, you could flip the blocks around different ways to get different patterns. Here I'm taking the binding and folding over about a quarter to a half of an inch of the fabric from the end and folding the binding back the way I had it and setting it against the back of the pot holder. I'm pinning it to secure it but I won't start sewing um, until I'm in about an inch or two so that I can put the end, tuck the end in there when I've gone completely around with the binding. I'm using a half inch seam allowance and I start by leaving about two to three inches left at the top of the binding. I stop about a half an inch from the corner and pivot the square and run off the edge. The same way I would do if I were binding a quilt. Fold the binding square with the edge and then stitch about a quarter inch from the edge.
couple of different ways in which this next part can be done. Here I am pinning, folding over and pinning the binding to the front and then uh, you'll see in a few minutes that I sew it in one continuous go around the whole thing. I started at one corner and then when I got to the next corner I pivot the needle or pivot the pot holder and continue on the next side. This is the way I usually do this but for some reason it didn't work out that well for me this time. There were a few puckers that I couldn't fix, and it just didn't have a very clean look to it. So I picked out the stitching and I started over. So on the second pot holder, I did it a little differently and then I went back and fixed the first one as well. It looks like I'm doing things the same way, but I pinned it down and stitched a side at a time, starting at one corner and tacking it down and sewing the side and then tacking it down at the end and so for me I was able to have more control and I feel like I got a cleaner better look to the pot holder so I'm just going side by side until I finish one of the big problems is the corners are very bulky and they sometimes slip because there's so much fabric to them or sometimes the needle has a hard time going through them. So I felt like doing it the second way helped a lot with that problem.
here. I'm almost to the end. I just have two more sides to sew and I'll be done. done sewing, clean up all of the stray threads and there you have your pot holder. Thank you for joining me in making the uh, stitch as you go or quilt as you go log cabin pot holders. They really are fun to make and I hope you'll try them. Press that like button if you like this video and subscribe if you want to, that'd be great. And thanks for watching, we'll see you in the next video, bye.